Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Did you know that Cedarville University Yellow Jackets compete in 16 NCAA Division II sports? Our athletes play hard as they honor Christ through their sport. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. You know that every time we have moved into a new big area like Wisdom or um, well, we didn't do poetry. We would have done poetry had it not been for the snow day. But whenever we move into a big area where there's a new kind of genre, we often spend some days talking about what's unique about that. And so we're going to do the same thing here with prophecy because now we're moving into a period uh, where a lot of what we're going to talk about is prophets. Not the only thing, but that's going to be the main thing from here on out. So let me just give you a little bit of background, uh, put prophets in contrast and comparison with other religious classifications. So we're going to start with the Nazarite, right? To, to understand a prophet, let's talk about Nazarites and priests and Levites and kings and put them all in perspective so we got them all straight in our minds. First of all, a Nazarite was somebody who was specially dedicated to God. It was a voluntary uh, choice generally, and you had to be clean, not touching any grapes or corpses or cuts, that is, cuts to your hair. Um, the most famous Nazarite we know of so far has been Samson. Uh -huh. uh, then there were Levites. Levites are workers in the temple or wood choppers, uh, which might sound a little bit facetious, and it is just a little bit, but it's 95% serious. Because in order to keep all those sacrifices and fires going, we don't have natural gas lines into ancient Israel. We have to use wood. It takes somebody a lot of time just to chop the wood, right? And that's what they do. They chop the wood and bring the water. So they got to be that by tracing their lineage to Levi, of course. This is one twelfth or one thirteenth of the population of Israel. The priests are offerers of sacrifices, and they are a subset of Levites. That is, they trace their lineage to Levi through Aaron. So... Uh, to use the, you know, if, if you can remember your geometry from high school, um, every priest is a Levite, but not every Levite is a priest. Right? Or to graph it out, Levi's four sons, Joey, Bert, Aaron, and Herman, <clears throat> of those, some are temple workers and some are temple sacrificers. Who are temple workers? Well, everybody is a temple worker. Everybody works there in some sense, but just that group are the temple sacrificers. So we call these guys Levites, we call these guys priests. See how the priest has this gradient shading from yellow to blue? It's pretty cool, isn't it? Huh? Isn't that neat? Because they. Okay, let's go on. <clears throat> Number four, prophets are proclaimers of truth. Notice the, the, the key words here. Uh, I, don't, I don't say predictors, even though they do predict, but I want to call them proclaimers, first of all, and you'll see why in a second. And they get that job because they are called of God. Notice already the different ways in which you kind of get your job. Some are voluntary, some are by who your mom and dad are, others are by God's direct choice. And finally here, the king, think of him as the chief executive officer, the guy who enforces the laws, and he traces his lineage to Judah through David much like the priest goes to Levi through Aaron. All right, so let's talk more about prophets and what they do. And the first thing I want to talk about is their description. And I'm going to say it has two Ds. It's like a doctor and it's Deuteronomic, okay? So when you think of the prophet, think of two things. Number one, like a doctor, that is they show up when the patient is sick. You know, sometimes you go to a doctor for, you know, an annual checkup, but typically you go when you're sick. And so when prophets show up, it's not a good thing. It's like, uh-oh, somebody's sick, whether it is the nation or even an individual. When does Nathan the prophet show up in David's life personally? When he's killed his best friend and slept with his wife, right? That's, that's when Nathan comes to him and says, David, there's something we have to talk about. And, of course, they do that for the whole nation as well. When Israel is sick and they've been following Baal, you know, Elijah will come along and say, Israel, we have something to talk about. When I say Deuteronomic, um, it's because they always preach from Deuteronomy. It's, in fact, it's almost, it's really becomes redundant. Every time a prophet shows up, he gets up to speak and he says, okay, would everybody open up your Bibles too? And everybody goes, oh no, Deuteronomy, right? Yes, yes, Why, how did you know, right? Well, it turns out it's because it's the Constitution, it's the law of the land. 
And another really good metaphor for thinking of what a prophet is like is like a prosecuting attorney. And as a prosecuting attorney, they're going to take Israel to court in order to prosecute her because of constitutional violations. It's really what's happening here. Now, there's a little example here. I don't want to take time to do it now. Uh, but where Elijah is on the, on the top of Mount uh, Carmel, and he knows rain is coming because Deuteronomy says so. We'll explain that in just a second here. Um, and let me, let me talk to you about this table. I think you have a table in your notes of the kind of things the prophets do. Now, these are, this is just a general uh, proportion based on my reading through the scriptures, right? There's nothing inspired about these numbers, but they're close. Right? So most of what they do here is preaching, that's the best way to think of it, about the present. So most of the time a prophet would get up, he would say, look, Deuteronomy, for sure, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? So that's pretty clear cut. Another part of what they would do is what I'm going to call natural prediction. What I mean by that is in contrast to supernatural prediction, there's some things anybody can predict. For example, it's not going to rain tomorrow. Now, again, notice my sarcasm or just a little bit of facetiousness. When the prophet, particularly the previous example we didn't talk about, Elijah says, look, there's going to be a drought here and it hasn't rained for three and a half years. Uh, he also can say that if you get rid of the prophets of Baal, it will rain tomorrow. Right? Now, again, you can't look at the forecast every day, but you can say if God is supernaturally withholding the rain as he said he would in the book of Deuteronomy, if you repent, get rid of the prophets of Baal, God will send the rain again, right? Any, anybody could do that. Or you could also say a nation will destroy you because Deuteronomy 28 verse 55 says, if you continually turn away from God, God will send a nation to come and grab you and put you into exile. Anybody can do that. In the very same way, you could predict about my life, you know, or I could predict about yours. If you follow God's ways and you turn your heart towards him, life is generally going to be better for you. Or if you run off the whales, and, whales, run off the whales, thinking of Jonah here. If you run off the rails, right? and try to run from God, that's not going to go well for you. That, that's, that's a natural prediction based upon the, the principles of Scripture. But the, the final category over here, from God, is a supernatural prediction about the future. For example, Babylon will destroy you. Jeremiah says this. And the difference between Jeremiah and other prophets is now all of a sudden we have specificity to the nation. Jeremiah says, hmm, you know, Deuteronomy said a nation would take you away, and I can tell you exactly which one it is. It's Babylon who's going to come if you don't repent of your ways. So, again, general statement, four-fifths of what they do seems to be preaching as you just read through the prophets. Another 10% seems to be natural prediction, and 5% for supernatural prediction. There's, it's some there, but not, not the majority of what they do. So they're mainly proclaimers, not predictors. Okay, you good? You good? Everybody's good except the science and business majors. You say, wait, wait, where's the other five? Oh, yeah, uh, I told you it was general, okay? Just so you don't think it's exact. So it's in there somewhere, I don't know where. All right, <clears throat> now, uh, I know you're going to make fun of my poor graphic skills. But don't do that because these are not my graphic skills, these are my son's. He graduated from Cedarville with a graphic design major, so here's what he did. But he did this when he was eight, okay? So <clears throat> I showed him my little Mediterranean Sea over there in blue, and he said, Dad, that is, that isn't, I don't know what that is. I said, well, buddy, what do you think we should do? He said, I think you should put some fish in it. I said, okay, you take the clip art and put anything in there you want to that makes it look like water. So he did. This is when he was eight, okay? And I know, I know, Brontosaurus does not live in the sea, <laughs> but we just liked it, so we put it there, so... We'll make fun of my boy. All right. So <clears throat> what I want to show you here is a little bit of the geography uh, of where the prophets fit. And there are, and, and I, I'm going to actually ask you on the final celebration where everybody ministered. But it's, it's going to be a lot easier than to think, and here's why. You only have to know three things. You have to know the first thing, that Amos and Hosea preach to the northern ten tribes. They're the only ones who do. Right? Amos and Hosea to the northern ten tribes. Then, in Nineveh, it's Jonah and Nahum. 
everybody knows Jonah anyway, and all you have to actually learn about is Nahum, right? So Jonah and Nahum, comparing the two of those together, both preaching about Nineveh, or not necessarily two, but about Nineveh, is a fantastic comparison. And then finally, over here, Ezekiel and Daniel were both deported to Babylon, and uh, right from there. So that's, that's really all you have to know. Just get those three down, memorize them, and then if there's somebody who isn't one of those six, they fit down here in the south in Judah. All right? So everybody else, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, all of them minister to the south uh, before, most of them, before the exile. All right? uh, next. <clears throat> this is going to get to be a little bit confusing, but it's not your fault or my fault. This is just the way classifications are. Let me, let me explain to you the Hebrew classification, and then I'll talk to you about the way most people in English classify these prophets. First of all, Hebrew classification. Everything I'm about to show you, and there are going to be 15 names here, are called the latter prophets. So it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then those other 12, what we typically think of as minor prophets, okay? In Hebrew, all these are latter prophets, um, all 15, but the ones on the right are also called the 12 because they were always grouped together uh, in the Jewish scriptures and called the 12. Um, now, let me, let me switch here real quickly and show you the English classification, right? which is, as you can see, the slight difference here. Right? In English, we're going to add Daniel to it, and we're going to call these the major and these the minor, right? So it doesn't change that much, but if, if someone talks about the 12, it's what other people call the minor prophets, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, major prophets, or just a part of the latter. Does that make sense to you? You can kind of go back and compare those two a little bit. Now, let me just talk about Daniel for a second. Uh, why English speakers put him down here and Hebrews don't. And that is because... We take a look at the material and think, wow, there's a lot of prophetic material there, and there is. There is an amazing amount of prophecy in the book of Daniel. But the Hebrews didn't look at, at what the content was. They looked at who wrote it. And so if someone had the full-time job of being prophet, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they'd put them in the category. If somebody had a different full-time job, like being a statesman, they would put Daniel's book in the writings, right? So the Law, Prophets, and Writings. So you, 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 I hope you don't wonder, well, which is it? Is it writing or is it prophet? It doesn't really matter. It's just the way they're classified, okay? Um, but um, in English, Daniel's referred to as a prophet. In Hebrew, he's not, even though they recognize his total predictive prophecy. Right? You will notice that there are a couple of hinge points here. What I mean is, uh, the, see the two vertical dashed lines? Uh, the first dashed line, 586, of course, is the exile. 536 is the return from the exile. So in the middle there, the middle, the, the middle block is the exile, and pre-exilic before and post-exilic afterwards. And you'll notice just by where most of the prophets are placed, something about what they do, right? You can probably make an observation or guess. What, what is God trying to do with most of the prophets, just based on where they come? Yeah, exactly, right? All of them here are probably a major goal is to prevent the exile, right? Uh, but <clears throat> after, once the exile happened, there was little point, and so we only got three post-exilic uh, prophets here, Haggai, Zechariah, and the Italian prophet uh, Malachi. Right? He's the only one. From... This is a really important concept. Uh, up until this point about prophets, it's been fairly easy to understand simple stuff, which you probably need to have in your bag of interpretive tricks. But this, this one, is a really big, robust, important principle that you've got to learn to be a better interpreter as well. This is, this is, the, this is a big idea. And again, I apologize for my lack of graphical abilities. But what I am attempting to demonstrate here are mountain peaks and valleys in between. Uh, when I was in college, I used to do a lot of uh, backpacking and mountain climbing and was climbing in the Adirondacks in upstate New York with a friend. And in the early morning, we got up to one mountain peak, Mount Marcy, and we had kind of a brunch up there. 
and I looked off at another mountain peak and I said, hey buddy, let's, let's go over there for lunch. And there was another mountain peak beyond that. I said, and let's, let's hike over that for dinner, right? And he said, are you nuts? I said, well, maybe, but wh why do you say? He says, because it's 40 miles to that first mountain peak and it's another 100 miles to that second one. There's no way we're gonna make it for lunch or for dinner today. And the trouble was, from that perspective, when there are big valleys in between, it's hard to see the distance in between. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is that the prophets experience this perfectly. So on these little mountain peaks, right, if you are the prophet and you are over here and you're looking this way, you see a couple of major peaks. You see the captivity and restoration. That's a big event in Israel's history. Then you see the Messiah's first coming and you see his second coming. But to you, they look like they're all on top of each other almost as though it's one big event. And you don't realize that if you've got a different perspective from like here in front of it, you'd see, whoa, there are big valleys in between there, right? Now, what this does then is does, is does not make them inaccurate at all. Everything the prophets say is absolutely true. What it does mean is that the time frame is difficult to predict from what they say. And so, take a look at a guy in the New Testament, a guy, named Peter, who points this out. Peter says this, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or, notice the key word here, time, the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Now, here's why it's a big deal. Because if you're Peter and you're living in the New Testament era after Jesus has ascended and gone to heaven and you're saying to everybody, Jesus is the Messiah, the number one question is, well, if he was Messiah, how come he didn't fulfill prophecy? And Peter's saying, oh, he did fulfill prophecy. Look at all these prophecies he fulfilled. And they say, yeah, but uh, there's one sort of big one and that is he didn't rule the world and get rid of Rome. And he's gone, for goodness sakes. This does not fit with the Old Testament prophecies. And, and Peter has to come along and say, okay, okay, okay. We gotta talk about this, here's the deal. These prophets were, were accurate in what they said, but they didn't always figure out the time element, especially with the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Now, do you see those two categories? If we go back here to this chart, can you put the sufferings of Christ on it and you, can you put the glories to follow on it? You see? Where are the sufferings of Christ? Point number three. And the glories to follow, point number four, right? And so in this time period, in this valley, in between the big gaps, realize that the fact that Jesus is not here reigning now, Peter is saying, and we can say the same thing now, does not mean that he won't, because the prophets, what they said is true, even though you, there are big time gaps in between, right? Now, the first example is this really important one from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Isaiah prophesies this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Now, notice this very carefully. There, there is a trinity here. You see it? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Yahweh has Messiahed me. You see this? There are three persons here. And what Isaiah is predicting is what the Messiah is going to say when he comes. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has Messiahed me. So you have all three persons there, and here's what Messiah is going to do. Proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, when Jesus speaks those in the synagogue, in Luke chapter 4, this is the way he begins his ministry, he goes to the synagogue and it's an incredibly poignant moment because as synagogue services work, we often ask uh, someone in the congregation here in the gathering to stand up and read scripture. Jesus takes the scroll of Isaiah 62, knowing exactly what he's doing, right, and opens it up, and he reads these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now, just imagine yourself in that moment, right? If you don't know what's going on, you're going to sleep. <clears throat> Guys doing the scripture reading for today, who cares, right? But what you're missing is, this is the moment Isaiah predicted. 
Messiah himself, it has never been true like any synagogue reader ever before than this one, because he can truly say, the Spirit of the Lord has messiahed me to preach this message. And so he reads it, and my guess is that he probably, I'm probably projecting here, but my guess is he reads this with all sorts of feeling, knowing how momentous this is, right? He's just been baptized, he's gone through the, the 40 days of temptation, and he comes back here and he preaches and starts his ministry in Nazareth. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, probably because he was reading it with such emotion, like, wow, nobody's ever done such a nice job of reading the scripture before. Well, I wonder why. But here's what I want you to look at. What I want you to see here is how does Jesus uh, quote it differently than Isaiah wrote it, and why does he do that? Now, keep in mind your mountain peaks, and if you do, you'll probably catch it. Do you see how Jesus quoted it differently? How he deliberately, intentionally was careful about what he said and what he didn't say. He began by saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. How did Jesus do it differently than what Isaiah did? Noah? He left out the part about like, the kingdom being there. Exactly. He left out the part about the kingdom being there, right? This is the way Isaiah says it. And what Jesus says <clears throat> is this. He leaves out the day of vengeance of our God, right? So when Isaiah comes and says in verse 2, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God, Jesus puts a period where Isaiah put a comma. Now, it's not inaccurate. He's just stopping at one point, right? <laughs> Why? Because it hasn't, is not yet time for the vengeance of our God, right? If we, if we uh, put that... Uh, uh, up on the screen here like this, he couldn't say today because the favorable year of the Lord is here, right? um, the first coming. The day of vengeance of our God is here at the second coming. So, let me, let me go back here. Let me get my PowerPoint mixed up. Jesus has to put a period there where Isaiah put a comma because in that comma where Isaiah put it, there are at least 2,000 years of history. Does this make sense to you? If Jesus had continued the day of vengeance of God, he had to say, today, and in another 2,000 years, this will all be done. So this is why Peter says, you know, the prophets saw accurately, and everything they said is true, but, but uh, the time frame is, is going to be a little bit confusing because there are big gaps in between certain parts of it. Now, let me go back then and show you another example, right? And this one is from uh, Micah. Now, I... I I could show you a whole bunch of these examples. Trust me, they are everywhere in the prophets. And, but this is one of the, one of the better ones. Uh, another example by Micah, where the kingdom is divided during Micah's time. The exile is near, and Judah needs a good leader. We haven't had a good king since David, pretty much. And we're looking for a better king than we have. And Micah 5, 2, you might recognize this from uh, Christmas lessons and Christmas readings. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Obviously fulfilled in Jesus' birth, right? Therefore, Israel will be abandoned in terms of a king. This is Micah speaking from his day, saying... God's going to send a new king, but until that king comes, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. Now, that is a magnificent portrait of all that Jesus is going to do. But do you realize that when Micah says this, He's covering several different mountain peaks and several different huge valleys in between. For example, <clears throat> if we take a look at a timeline here, we can take the time when she was in labor, uh, excuse me, Israel will be abandoned. Sorry, the, the arrow doesn't quite fit there. Israel will be abandoned. That's 586. We don't have a king sitting on, on the uh, throne anymore. Um, 4 BC, when she who is in labor gives birth, uh, that is, of course, Jesus' birth, four years before Christ. I know it sounds funny, but uh, 
we finally realized from archaeology that Herod died in 4 BC. So when the people first started to figure out what's zero, when was Jesus born, they didn't quite get it right. So Jesus is born four years before zero, right? And then the rest of this <clears throat> will stand and shepherd his flock at the second coming. Now, to put this on our chart that we had before, uh, we've got point number two here, point number three here, and point number four all the way up there. Right? So is it true? Yes, it's totally true. Has it all happened yet? No, it hasn't happened yet. If you understand the time, you're okay. But, but here's, here's one of the problems, right? Imagine it's 50 AD. You are in Peter's place, right? You're experiencing the situation that Peter did when he wrote 1 Peter. And you're trying to witness to your Jewish neighbor. Let's just, again, pretend you're back in Israel, you're a believer in Jesus, and you're trying to witness to your Jewish neighbors and say Jesus is the Messiah. So here's what happens. <clears throat> Someone responds to you and says, how can any thinking person claim that Jesus is Messiah? You say, well, it's written all over the Old Testament, right? He's fulfillment of these things. And they say, well, look, the prophecies clearly show that Messiah will gather all Israel together and shepherd them, and Jesus didn't do that. The Romans are still in charge. And this is why Peter comes along and says, well, wait, hold on, hold on. Just because he hasn't done it yet, there are big time gaps in between the verses. This is what the prophets didn't see. So Jesus isn't the one. Let's look for another person. And so Peter writes what he does in 1 Peter and... And the Gospels, in some sense, are an answer to this kind of a question. Not only do the Gospels explain who Jesus is, but they also explain this big gap, right? For example, the book of Matthew is dedicated to, dedicated to answering this question. Jesus is the Messiah, chapters 1 to 11 will say, but because of the rejection by Israel, chapters 12 to 23, his reign will be postponed for an indefinite time period, after which he will return to judge and shepherd Israel in what we call the Olivet Discourse or the Second Coming Passages where all of these things in fact are fulfilled. So as you take a look at Old Testament prophecies you're often going to find this idea of the whole story told in one passage. And to the discerning reader you have to recognize yes that is all true and I can put my faith and trust in it the timing I will leave to God, right? Because even now, don't you wonder, even as a New Testament believer, when will Jesus come back? Why is it so long? Isn't he coming back soon? And of course, the New Testament writers wondered, even Paul said, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the Lord in the air, right? We who are alive and remain. Paul expected this in his day. So this 2,000 year gap, you kind of wonder, well, what about the time? And God says, don't worry about the time. Right? You worry about the big events that are going to happen. They will happen. Leave the timing to me. And, and it just remind, reminds me of this, this, again, poignant moment in my life when my grandson came up to me one day and said, Grandpa, today, it was his birthday, he said, today I'm, and he worked really hard to get his fingers just right, I, I'm this many, I'm four, right? And it was so, oh my gosh, when he said that, floods of memories came back because I could remember when his mom was four. And we, we, we went to the zoo that day, and it was so funny because she was obviously a little kid. She was four years old. And um, the, the lady, the attendant said, the children are, th are free. And Mindy was so upset. She said, I'm not free. I'm four, right? <laughs> so just all these memories are coming back when Jack says, hey, Grandpa, I'm four, right? And I thought about saying, yeah, and next year you're going to be five, and then six, and then you're going to start driving a car, and then you're going to get married, and then, you know, on and on. But I didn't say that to him, because if I'd said, uh, uh, someday you're going to be five, what would have happened? Well, he would have come back the next day, and he would have said, uh, Grandpa, am I five today? And, no, no. Uh, the next day, am I five yet? No. The next day, am I five yet? And after a while, he'd get discouraged and give up, like it's never going to come true, right? He, he just couldn't handle that time element. God tells us what we can handle. Here's the big event. This is what's going to happen. I could tell you about the time, but you wouldn't understand it. You wouldn't get it right. right. And besides, that's not the point. So this is the prophets. This is the big idea of what's going on in the prophets. And as we move through, you're going to see a lot of opportunities to use it as a helpful interpretive tool. So remember, it's the time thing right, that uh, the prophets don't get. Uh, everything else is pretty clear. All right? You with me? You good?
Okay, then let's, uh, let's go on and take a look at the other two books for today. And uh, let's start then with Jonah and Nahum. As we saw in the prophetic introduction, these two guys are kind of grouped together for a certain reason. We're going to study Jonah first because he is really an early prophet, but Nahum is naturally connected with him because they're both associated with Assyria or Nineveh. So today uh, we're going to take a look at a small, small picture of the most important event of all time, uh, a story of mission and mercy, and then with Nahum, a story of justice and vengeance that kind of counterbalances Jonah, and uh, a little advice about how to put up with annoying people. So, I'm going to scoot through Jonah here pretty quickly because I think it's one of those books that almost everybody is pretty familiar with, although we'll, we'll hit some highlights here. So let's start with the overall structure of the book. As almost always is the case, uh, the structure is kind of a key to what's going on here. And in chapters 1 and 2, God's word comes first. Then there is a prayer of deliverance, this time on the part of Jonah in the whale. And then there is a rescue where he is uh, rescued from the ocean. Right? In chapter 3, God's word comes a second time. Then there is a second prayer, this time on the part of the Ninevites. And then there's a rescue, this time of them. Right? So you got this repetition, this repetition. And then in chapter 4, we have an object lesson. Now, what I want you to see is this. Like the punchline of a joke or an arrow, get ready for a corny joke here. The point comes at the end. Get it? Get it? Right here? So, so here's what I want to say. There are lots of interesting little lessons in 1, 2, and 3, but the big idea where we really need to focus in on is the object lesson, and that's where we're going to camp out a little bit. So let's start in the beginning and get ready to move to the punchline there in chapter 4. In chapter 1, the word Lord comes to Jonah, and God, of course, says, go to Nineveh. Uh, because its wickedness has come up before me, but Jonah ran away. We all know the story, right? Joppa, about the only seaport Israel has on the west coast, is here, and Tarshish is somewhere out in here. Now, Nineveh is not exactly 180 degrees away, but it's close enough, right? And so the geography gives you insight into his heart. God says, go here. He says, mm -mm, go in the other way, opposite direction doesn't want to do this, and we don't know why exactly yet, but we'll find out later why he doesn't want to do this, because the Assyrians are so wicked and cruel, and he just hates them like crazy. So what's interesting is that in chapter 1 and 3, he interacts with pagans, and we see this easy comparison. Typically, if you want to feel good about yourself, you find someone worse than you are to compare yourself with. You know, if you're having a bad day, where do you start? Let's, let's go with sailors. They generally work well as a comparison, okay? So when you take a look at him in comparison with the, with the pagan sailors, you'd think the prophet would not look so bad, but watch what happens here. The sailors were afraid because they recognized this big storm is from God. They don't know God's name as Yahweh, but they still recognize God is trying to get our attention. So they're afraid, and Jonah falls into a deep sleep below deck. Now, which of those are better responses to God? Is it better to, to have a, certain, a healthy fear of the Lord, or is it better to sleep when he's answering, when he's knocking? So you might say, well, he, he's, just, uh, he's just totally uh, confident in God, and that's why he's sleeping. I don't think so. I think this is kind of callousness on his part because of what the captain says. How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. So um, they get to Jonah and they say, uh, who, who's responsible for doing all this? Who are you? Where, where are you from? What people are you? And Jonah responds, <laughs> I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. I worship him. I just don't obey him. If you really do worship him, what are you, what are you doing here? Right? And so... Uh, this terrified them. Again, I think that's a very positive thing. Uh, why? Well, because we just learned in wisdom, right? The beginning of wisdom is what? Fear the Lord, right? And, and pagan sailors seem to be more spiritually sensitive than the prophet. And then there's a second comparison between the sailors and Jonah here, where he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. 
and it'll become calm. Now, we know how the story ends, but they, of course, don't. So when Jonah says, throw me into the sea, what is he asking for? What's he doing? He's, he's committing suicide, right? He says, I hate those Assyrians so much, I would rather die than go to them. And in fact, uh, I want you guys to do it. I mean, I could just jump over, but uh, I'm making you do it, so my blood's on your hands, right? And they say, no, 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 we, we, don't, we don't want to do that, right? Um, now, get the irony of this, right? Uh, Jonah would rather die than see the Assyrians live. And his value of life is really, really poor. He didn't care about the Assyrians or his own life. So how did the pagan sailors figure into this? And the answer is, the pagan sailors say no, right? The, the word here is instead. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. I mean, if I were on a ship that was sinking, and someone said, chuck me overboard and you can live, uh, I wouldn't take very long to think about what I was going to do. But the pagan sailors say, no, life is too valuable. Well, let's try to row back to land. And so they do, realize they can't. And then when, of course, they can't, they cry to the Lord and say, God, please forgive us. We don't want to do this. So they chuck him overboard. Uh, and at this, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows to him. Uh, Jonah has nothing to do with their salvation, but it looks like these guys get saved, right? So, what happens next? Well, God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. This is a clear, no kidding around, true blue miracle, uh, which, which tends to be kind of a foreshadow of what happens to Jesus. Now, um, it doesn't mean that Jonah is any kind of savior figure, but the sense is that God protects him, has mercy on him, and brings him out of the fish the same way he went in, alive, okay, uh, as a foreshadowing of, of the resurrection. Second part of the story then. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give to you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, went to Nineveh, obeyed sort of, right? This is an incredibly reluctant obedience, as we find out in a minute. But he's saying, wow, uh, no, no more of those whales. I guess I learned my lesson. I guess I better go. He reluctantly uh, obeys and goes. And notice the statement, no, Nineveh was an important city, required three days. So we don't know if that means three days through or three days around, but, but it would take at least three days to get the message out to everyone. So what's important about that number is the number which follows it, which is this. On the first day, Jonah started in the city proclaimed 40 more days, and then it will be overturned, and the Ninevites believe God. I mean, and th this is a revival from top to bottom. You notice it goes all the way to the king, and it's genuine, and, it, and it's real. And so even though it would take you three days to go through this whole thing, on the very first day, Nineveh is such ripe fruit that it just falls off the ground. And in fact, what I want you to notice is how incredibly lame Jonah's message is. You see what's there? I mean, it's only five words in Hebrew. Do you notice what's there and what's not there? What's not there in Jonah's message? There's no mention of God, no mention of hope, no mention of salvation, right? N none of that, but it's like he doesn't even care. It's, it's like he's trying to sabotage his own mission. Ah, there it is. God's going to destroy everything. He's going to turn everything over. What's really funny is that the word that he uses, overthrown, he means in terms of destruction, but as it turns out, the whole, the, the, the actual word means to turn over, and that's exactly what happens, because the, their fortunes are turned upside down. So, uh, his response to this, of course, uh, God's response, is that he relents of the destruction he had threatened, um, and here, then, is the final object lesson. Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, and a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, this is in some ways satirical. It's like, how can a prophet even say this? I hope you understand what's so incredibly wrong here. Jonah chews God out for being merciful. The guy who just received mercy chews God out. I knew it was going to happen. I was afraid you were going to save these people. Can't stand it when you save people. It really ticks me off. 
Now, O Lord, take away my life, or it's better for me to die than live. There it is again, right? Uh, just chuck me into the sea. I'd rather die again. And um, what's amazing to me is God's sweet, soft answer to him. Because if I were God, and this is one of the good reasons I'm not God, if Jonah said to me, take my life, I'd, I'd like to die, I know what my answer would be. Like, I can answer that prayer. Yes, it's done. Boom, done. You're gone. Right? Uh, but God gives him a very soft answer and says, do you really have any right to be angry? Now, I want you to notice what's inside the red rectangle here because we're going to see a very similar situation again, and I want you to compare it with this. So you know the story of the vine. God gives him a vine that grows up over him, gives him shade, because he goes outside the city hoping that they'll repent of their repentance and God will yet destroy them. And then, of course, the worm comes and takes away the vine. Now, notice in the space of just six verses here, he is greatly displeased at the salvation of the Ninevites, and he is very happy about the vine. So those two emotions, anger and joy, are real clues into his value system. And in fact, if you want to know what makes your heart beat, you can use the same measure. Ask yourself what makes you angry and what makes you happy. The things that make you angry and the things that make you happy are a good clue to what's important to you, to your values. And here you can see the value of unsaved people coming to know God and his personal comfort um, are, are, are the things which are important or unimportant to him. So at dawn the next day, the uh, worm comes and uh, takes away the vine. And again, he goes back to this thing, oh, I wish I could die, right? Now, in this little rectangle, compare it with what you saw first and tell me, how does it differ from the first conversation? Basic Bible study. If you want to understand what the book is about, you've got to be able to notice the difference in the conversations to see the progression. What's different? Jonah answers the question. So can you evaluate that for me? Can you tell me what you think about that? Does that show progression or regression? Yes, I think you're absolutely right, right? I mean, it's one thing for the kid or for Jonah to look at God and chew him out. I wish I could die, right? And then God gives this soft answer, which is supposed to give... You know, a soft response, do you have any right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said, I'm angry enough to die. This shows me a Jonah who is not getting better. This shows me a Jonah who is getting worse. And here's the saddest part. That's the last thing he gets to say in the book. That's the very last word we hear from this prophet. And so God takes the last word, and God says this, you've been concerned about this vine. They did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people. You cannot tell their right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. And I always love that part. And God says, and there are cows. <laughs> I just love those cows. 120,000 eternal souls, but there are cows too. I still, I love even the cows. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Now, see, this would be a very perfect point for Jonah to get to answer the question, but number one, I don't think he's smart enough to do it. And more importantly, this is not about Jonah anymore. It's about you, the reader. Right? So Jonah doesn't answer it, but guess who gets to do it? You do, right? And I do. And we answer that question every day by the choices which we make. Should I be concerned about that city? Let me ask you, are you concerned about that city? So to, to make this point really clear, he brings it home to Jonah and says, okay, here we, here's what we've got, Jonah. I know this may be a hard question. Don't hurt yourself I'm trying to come up with the answer. But which is more valuable, 120,000 souls which will live for eternity in heaven or hell, or this plant? And Jonah says, oh, wow, uh, let's see, 120,000 people Versus the plant, uh, that's a hard question. I, um, I'm guessing uh, um, the plant, right? right? 
And you look at Jonah and you think, poof, <laughs> right? But, but what the book is trying to do is to, is to turn a mirror towards you and me and say, uh, got plants? Have you got any plants? Well, as you take a look at the, at the, the choices you make in my life, am I more concerned about my personal comfort than I am the salvation of people who've never heard? So just retrace the story of Jonah with me. Chapter 1, he was at this level of direct disobedience. By the time we get to the end of chapter 2, he might be doing better with reluctant obedience, right, where he ultimately goes, but where does he finish? And the answer is he finishes here. He's angry at God. Jonah is not a positive character. There's no redemption in the character. He doesn't get better. He only gets worse. So Jonah is a caricature. He's a gross exaggeration. I don't mean it's not true. I just mean that in order to make the point, God is, is uh, drawing him in fantastic proportions of foolishness. No one will be as deliberately foolish and mistaken in their values as he is, I hope, but is there a lot of Jonah in me? Is there even some Jonah in me? Is the question. And to go back to where we were with Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> remember that message where God wants you to enjoy life. That message was predicated upon God honoring values and goals. If you want to live for God, then take Ecclesiastes and apply it, and you will have abundant life. But if you start with God neglecting values and goals and think it's all about me, and add the message of God wants me to enjoy life, you end up with Jonah. This is where Jonah is. Jonah thinks that all the goodness of God, all the mercy of God is his alone and not anybody else's. Doesn't care about anybody else. I think Jonah is a really, really powerful book for all ages, but especially for 21st century evangelicalism. Is it not Ecclesiastes misapplied? So to put these together properly, let me say, let's enjoy life as you carry the good news of God's grace to the world. So let's see what we learn about God, right? It's always where we want to go. <clears throat> what do we learn about God? And who is Yahweh from this? Yahweh is the creator of all people and cows. <coughs> God loves them. I love those cows too, don't you? Creator of all people and cows who grieves for his creation and provides salvation for all who will receive it, even enemies. Does it bother you that God loves your enemies? Enemies in the Middle East, enemies here, enemies back home. Does it bother you that God loves your enemies? Are there people that you've just written off in terms of salvation because you don't like them anyway? If you do, that's the spirit of Jonah. If your life is dedicated toward getting things that make you comfortable instead of thinking about 120,000 souls, that's the spirit of Jonah. Now, is that the only picture of Yahweh we get here? And the answer is no. There's another one in Nahum that bears looking at. So, let's take a look at Nahum. And we'll start with a little multiple choice quiz here. According to Nahum, my God is a holy, be glorious, C, sarcastic, <laughs> it's going to be an easy multiple choice quiz, and vengeful. And the right answer is E, two of the above. And the right two of the above are sarcastic and vengeful, two things my mom told me not to be. Why do you have to be so sarcastic? If I'd only known then that God is sometimes, I would have had more ammunition, but it's a good thing I didn't know. But according to Nahum, we find out both of those things are true. So let's take a look at Nahum and Jonah together and contrast them. Now, this little chart here, this little statement, only applies to each one of these little categories, only applies to one of them. So when I say, who went to Nineveh, obviously we know the answer is Jonah, but I'm also trying to make the counterpoint that Nahum did not go to Nineveh. All right? So Jonah did, Nahum did not. Who preached to Ninevites? Obviously, Jonah did. Again, making the point, Nahum did not preach to Ninevites. Nahum preached to Israelites. Who preached salvation? And the answer is uh, Jonah did, and Nahum didn't. And I'm sure that in, in heaven, Jonah would have been really upset about this. It's like, oh, come on. If somebody gets to preach destruction, can I do that? 
God says, no, you, you do the salvation. Nahum will preach destruction. Right? So the answer here is not Jonah, but Nahum preached destruction. And who wrote his letter to comfort Israel? This one's a little bit of a clue, a little bit of a pun. And the answer is it was Nahum, because that's what Nahum means, be comforted my people. Okay? So it's kind of strange to look at this book, which is all about destruction, and wonder how does it comfort. But we will find it here as we take a look at the text. So I only have the outline on the screen. I'm going to kind of I'm going to read from my text, and if you have your Bible open, you might want to take a look at it too. We're going to start with God's character as avenger, stated in the very early parts of the book, and you see it from the very beginning all the way to the end. And it's described in the very first uh, sentence as, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. And so that kind of sets the tone for all of this about his vengeance and his anger. And in the first chapter here, it's described as, as, as like a volcano that when it erupts will obliterate everything. Verse 5, the mountains quake before him and, he, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? Now, at points, Israel is saying, well, why doesn't God show his anger? And God says, in time I will, and I will show it on Assyria, on Nineveh, at the right time. And when I do, there will be no escape. And the rest of the book is, des describes this sort of thing. I'm not going to go into detail here, but let me just say this. In chapter 1, he makes this declaration that Nineveh will be completely destroyed. Then in chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, it will be permanently destroyed. Not only completely, but it won't, it won't come back. And in um, chapter 2, verses uh, 1 to 2, the imminence of her end, it's going to happen soon. So what really is unusual about this book is not just that Assyria will be judged, but the eagerness with which it's described. Notice this. In chapter 2, verses 3 to 9, there's this very graphic and detailed account of the battle. It, it, it's, it's almost like it's an Old Testament video. It says this, The shields of the soldiers are red, the warriors are clad in scarlet, the metal in the chariots flashes on the day they are made ready. Uh, they storm through the streets. And so it's this very eagerly, graphically pictured battle. And then it gets even stronger, right? In verses, uh, chapter 2, verse 13 and on, um, I'm just going to read some from chapter 3 here. It says this, just this very short little sentences. Uh, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses, jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number. It's almost like, whoa, Nahum, <laughs> you're a little too eager for this kind of thing. But realize this is not simply Nahum. This is also the capital author, A, capital A author, God himself, who is vigorously going after this, right? Then it talks about the hopelessness of the city, compares it to Thebes. Again, not to give you too much background here, but Thebes was a city in uh, Egypt, which was, interestingly, strategically surrounded by a river, kind of like on an island and, and with this river going around it, had this perfect moat, and, and Nineveh was very much the same way. And yet God used Assyria to destroy Thebes, and God says, hmm, do you think you're better than they are? I'm going to do the same thing to you you did to Thebes. And then there is this sarcastic address to prepare for the enemy. I don't know any other way to say it. Uh, as you read through verses 14, it says, this is a command, draw water for the siege, strengthen your defenses, work the clay, tread the mortar, repair the brickwork, right? And then it says, there the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you down. Right? It's like, sure, go ahead, try to defend yourselves. A lot of good that's going to do. So this, this book is just filled with this, sarcasm and, and, and uh, vengeance. And then finally, there's this specific address to the king, which, uh, which really taunts him. It is just 6th century BC trash talk. And that's how the book ends. And you say, no, no wait a minute. This is, this is not a very nice book. Right? This is all about destruction. What, what does this tell us? And I think the point might be best described like this. Zechariah talks about the very same thing, and, and, and Zechariah puts it like this. This is what the Lord Almighty says, after he has sent me against the nations that have plundered you. Right? This is Nahum. This is Assyria. For whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. 
and I will surely raise my hand against them. Now, I want to talk about this phrase, whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now, that's a phrase we've all heard before. You may not know what it is, but you probably think, well, it's probably the uh, apple that you've set your eye on or something. If you like apples and you have one in the dining hall and it's sitting there by you and one of your friend comes and grabs it, um, you, you know, you don't like that because, come on, man, that's my apple. That's the apple of my eye, right? You just took the apple of my eye. No, 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 you didn't. Right? What's, what's funny about this is that the apple of one's eye, is, it kind of goes back to this King James error. That's the way it's originally described in King James. But the apple of one's eye was not a piece of fruit. The apple of one's eye is actually more accurately translated, and what it meant to them was the pupil of one's eye. Now, let, let's think about this for a second, okay? <clears throat> just for illustra illustrative purposes, would you mind if I took your pen? Is it working? Oh, it is. Good. Would you mind if I took your pen and just touched the uh, cornea of your eye? I would. You sure? Yeah. Come on. Come on, man. We're on camera. Yeah, okay. okay? So, I mean... <laughs> Can't you just take one for the team here? I'll just I'll touch it real lightly. I won't I won't push hard. I'll just touch it. Okay, okay. Sure. You sure? Absolutely right. <laughs> Come on. I don't want to. I don't do this wrong. I want to just just as soon as I touch you, just say something. Okay. Something. <laughs> it's gonna make you squeamish, doesn't it? Well, I no. I'm not, I wouldn't do it. Right? I wouldn't do it. You know I wouldn't do it. But just just the thought of someone actually touching your cornea just makes you. Nuts, doesn't it? What God is saying is, when Assyria did this to Israel, do you think I didn't notice? It's like they touched the cornea of my eye, the pupil of my eye. I absolutely noticed. And in the right time, I will take vengeance. And so what, what this book does, what Nahum does for us, I think, is this, among other things, it kind of explains to us why the New Testament teaching about revenge works, right? In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And in the story of Nahum, what you see is God not just kind of barely fulfilling the job, but God going after this with eagerness and a vigor and a strength that is, will blow Assyria away. God says, don't you get involved in vengeance. This is my job. You don't know how. I know how. You don't know how much. I know how much. You don't know when. I know when. This is my job. Don't you dare get involved in it. You let me do the job, and I will do it. And Nahum gives substance to that kind of declaration. When I take my own vengeance, what I'm actually saying is, I don't trust you, God, to do your job. What we're saying is, I want to be in control of the situation, God. I don't, want, I don't want you to be in control. And what Nahum says is, you can trust God to do it. In fact, if you think about Nahum, hopefully there is some sense of pity for those poor people. You say, wow, uh, I, don't, I don't need to get my own vengeance. If someone does me dirt, if someone does me wrong, if someone cheats me, if someone lies about me, someone says those things about me, I really feel sad because they just touch God's, the pupil of God's eye. And God will do vengeance in the right time, the right way. And I don't have to do that. And if you think about this deeply, it's an incredibly freeing thought that I don't have to worry about getting even. God will take care of that in his time. Do you believe that? If you do, it frees you to act completely differently to someone who has done you wrong. I will know I have trusted God to avenge me when I want good for the other person. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, Romans 12 says this. Don't take vengeance on your enemies, right? But rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. What this allows us to do then is to say, I'll leave vengeance to God, and all I will do is good. I will do good to them and allow God to take vengeance in the right time. So let me, let me talk a little bit more then about Jonah and Nahum together and what this tells us about who Yahweh is. So who is Yahweh again from Nahum? And the answer is he's the creator of all people and cows still, who grieves for his creation, but the, notice the opposite nature of the message. He will execute justice and vengeance on all who reject his mercy. So I neglected to say, but I hope you could figure out, that Jonah is one generation of Ninevites and Nahum is another. Right? 
And that generation of Ninevites that repents, God demonstrates incredible mercy and rescues them. But on a later generation that does not repent, there is amazing justice and vengeance. So the previous message, would God provide salvation for all who receive his mercy? That's Jonah. And this is Nahum. Now, as you look at those two together, um, you know, it is a skeptical mind which says, wow, there's a contradiction. Or it's a skeptical or immature mind which says, wow, that is a, uh, that, that, that's a fickle God. And I, and I think it is a mature mind who says, no, this, this is a loving father, the way he responds to people. Who is Yahweh? Yahweh is a God who loves his creation, who grieves for his creation and hates what sin does to his creation, but in his mercy, he provides salvation for people who will accept. But if people don't accept, this is the God who provides justice and vengeance on all who reject his mercy. So that what you have here is this amazing balance with Jonah and Nahum, and my friends, this generation, I don't mean your generation, I mean, 21st century evangelicalism absolutely needs both doses of these. We're so wrapped up in our own comfort that we don't care about sending mercy to people we don't hate, right? But we also think, if we, if we, if we overdo that and think God is merciful, God is merciful, we just think, oh, God is so tolerant, it's okay, God will let you get away with that. If, it's, if that's the way you're made, or that's the way you feel, it's okay, God, God is just merciful, right? And this, this two-pronged message about who Yahweh is from Jonah and Nahum say, no, God, God, God is merciful to those who come to him and confess their sin. There is mercy today in Jesus. But if you turn away from Jesus, there is only justice and vengeance for all who reject him. Well, isn't your God tolerant? No, he's totally tolerant. That's why he provides Jesus. But if you reject Jesus and the mercy there, then there is nothing but justice and vengeance for those who reject. Both of those are not contradictory. They are complementary about the full orbed nature of who Yahweh is. And if that's who Yahweh is, then that's the kind of people, the kind of message, the kind of lives that we want to mimic and mirror as well.